Biden wins, I'm leaving the country. This is not a political statement. I just want to travel again. Um, and I, I've spent nine months plus now that I've not been on an airplane. That that has not occurred since I began my first year 36 years ago. So the content, you know, getting a path back to normal is an important one and a critical one. So we're starting to see this, if you want to call it, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I think that's important. In the interim, we're still going to have some time here that we're going to have to be very careful. And, you know, they have a lovely term now for people who aren't careful. It's not new. It started back in April of last year when young college kids were going on spring break. Um, and, and they called it COVID idiots. And I firmly believe that, that people who don't take care are indeed that. Um, we can prevent so much just by our own behavior. And I think society is struggling with that because we're not used to being closed down and caged in. And uh, there was a study done by the American Psychological Association came out about three weeks ago of Generation Z. Um, and for my friends in Canada, Generation Z. But um, kids between the ages of like 18 and 24 and 50% of them are suffering from some symptom of depression. So the societal aspects of this are incredibly heart, you know, heartfelt and, um, and, it, and is very difficult. Economically, we've done fairly okay, despite the initial shock, if you want to call it back in March, April timeframes. Um, and the, re the reason I said it because we have the technology that allows us to do things. So people are ordering more stuff online. They're working out at home with you know equipment as opposed to going to the gym. Um, there's a lot of takeout food. Uh, the three biggest areas, for example, in the second quarter of this year for consumer spending, and it all makes sense when you think about it, was one, do it yourself at home. So people said, I can't go out on the weekend to do things, I can't take my children to soccer practice, to dance, to whatever, to the zoo. To the zoo. So they went out and they bought paint and they bought shelving and they did the things they wanted to do for a long time, but finally got the opportunity to do it. The second area was food away from home. People got tired of spaghetti and meatballs and they said, you know, let's order out Thai food or let's order, you know, you know let's put in the, in the Jewish community, like uh, Izzy Smokehouse was doing deliveries to the five towns really exciting moment to get some smoked brisket, right? And it, it kind of made your meal a little bit more fun than just being stuck at home. And the third area was um, in electronics. Some of that was required. Work from home, your computer wasn't really, the one you had at home wasn't really ready for this. It was five years old. Um, you needed tablets for your, or, or laptops for your kids for you know remote learning or Zoom school. All that was changing. So these are people bought big screen TVs because their entertainment now was Netflix, not going to the movie theater. They bought Xboxes, Switches, all these kind of gaming devices to again entertain themselves. So the economy was actually doing far better than I think a lot of people anticipated um, because of technology. Imagine if this happened 30 years ago and we didn't have all these devices and we didn't have all these ways to communicate. So. It, it's been far better than I think most of us even perceived it would look like in March or April. Okay. Um, now, turning to a, a little bit of a different topic, I know that you have a broad view of economies and industries. So what is your view uh, with regards in terms of Israel economies, the Israeli economy in terms of its position for the future? especially with regards to these more recent peace deals, um, which open up tremendous vistas for their economy. So it's interesting. I, I, I'm very fortunate. The city has a joint venture with a company in Israel, one of the large investment houses there. And we, I get to go to Israel every year to go visit our institution, our institutional clients there. And I, again, most of the, not most, all of the work I really do is for our institutional client base. So for the people who, might want to get a sense of what that is. We're talking to portfolio managers at Fidelity. We're talking to portfolio managers at a bunch of major hedge funds, at T. Rowe Price at Capital, all the places that you might have money um, with, with those funds. And we don't do a lot of stuff with, in fact, currently we do nothing with traditionally what's called high net worth individuals who have brokerage accounts at Morgan Stanley, at you know, Merrill Lynch and things like that. Uh, we used to own Smith Barney. We sold that. Um, but we do a lot of stuff with our private bank customers, and these are ultra, ultra high net worth people. So, you know, I do con have conversations with um, some of uh, these centi-millionaire, billionaire type 
people who get special access through the city private bank. But um, when we talk to the institutions and they go to Israel and I get this opportunity, they always ask me kind of the same question. And, you know, what do you, what do you think about the Israeli companies? And, and it's not my area of expertise, but if you think about where Israel tends to be very strong in terms of the, their business areas, they tend to be really strong in areas like technology, biotechnology, um, that are actually really important. And it is why Israel has been you know, a startup nation, but also incredibly successful in their export markets. Um, and we saw that with companies like Intel buying Mobileye, for example, uh, to enter the sensors business. Um, somebody put up a question about the auto industry. It asked me a question, why are auto prices higher today? And, you know, obviously it's not because of these cool electronics that you're getting that are telling you don't drift out of your lane and sends a, you know, a beeping sound. Or if you're too close to a car, it's, it's already telling you to brake or indeed is braking for you because this is what some of this technology can do. And Israel has been a huge leader in that, um, in that area, not, not specifically autos, but in general software, like, you know, anybody who, sits there and says they want to do BDS and boycott Israel, well, they better have to get, they better give up their text messaging services because Israel was the first ones to come up with that and develop that. And it's, it's happening in a variety of areas. So in that sense, Israel is really well positioned in terms of um, its marketplace. Is it, you know, does Israel have other challenges? Absolutely. Um, with, with respect to the auto price question that was asked, I will answer it. Uh, used prices have gone up dramatically as people have gotten very fearful of going on public transportation. So they bought up used cars to, to travel as opposed to getting on trains, subways, et cetera, or buses. And that's pushing up the new car market as well, because once you take the used cars off the marketplace, people have to buy something and they will then see some higher demand and the supply prices go up. It's, it's not that complicated. Okay. So we're going to put up a picture now. And you know, when you did the interviews live in the studio, but with COVID, um, you're no longer doing the live interviews or probably not as much. And I think those interviews, some of them are being held out of your home. So for everybody, Pardo, I, we have a picture. I want to do a share screen for everyone to see as I ask this question, they'll appreciate it. So this was, I don't know, this was on CNBC, um, probably recently. I don't know when it was taken. Uh, but it's it's Tuvia being interviewed as Tobias uh, in front of his uh, svarim shrank. And so we could see a whole selection of uh, his svarim, his pictures, um, and, and a uh, actually two, I think it looks like two chauffeurs. And I'm just wondering if you got any comments, you know, if, first of all, A, is that your central location when you get interviewed? And if it is, you know, for all these people who might have been listening to you all these years, being interviewed in the studio, not knowing your deep connection, certainly to Sfarim with Hebrew letters on them. Um, has, so, have you gotten any response to that? Yes, it's a simple answer, but um, so that's not really my Sfarim trunk to be, to be fair. It's an area in my, in my downstairs den where there's a computer a different, in a different direction. I purposely set it up that way, not because of the Sfarim, but because during the interview, I don't want to be distracted by what's going on on my screens. So I purposely am like turned a totally different direction away from the screens and I don't get, you know, the, the market or an email or something that would be very, very problematic in the middle of the interview and just kind of cut out for a second while I'm focusing. Uh, I, I think I told you, Rabbi, that for a producer on, on TV, a minute is an eternity. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're always worried about how long everything takes and you get distracted, it really messes you up. Um, so I have gotten a lot of responses. Um, I would say the, the funniest one I got, and it was through LinkedIn, was somebody tagging that pic a picture of that. Um, it was three Hasidic guys in the insurance business in, in either Brooklyn, in, somewhere in Brooklyn, near Borough Park or Williamsburg. And one guy said, wow, Rambam and, and, and Graham Dodd, and Ben Graham was the father of value investing. And another guy kind of responding, you know, kind of, uh, you know, amazing, and a third, a guy, a third guy, Kiddush Hashem, but, you know, and that was kind of fun for me, because it was, you know, Kiddush guys with Bayes down, it was really funny. Um, I've gotten emails um, from people in Silicon Valley saying, love the Judaica behind you, and my, probably one of my favorites, there's one of the uh, CNBC anchors, a woman named Sarah Eisen, um, who's a lovely person, a lovely Jewish girl from, um, a woman, I should say, from 
um, from Cincinnati. She actually knew my one of my second cousins there, uh, who was no longer living, but a conservative rabbi named Ben Sion Wachholder, and her family knew him. So it's kind of funny. She sent me a text just saying, wait a minute, is that a chauffeur in the background? Because uh, she thought it was really funny. Um, so it, it's it's been it's been you know kind of a cute little aspect to it. I figure if I do one as we're getting closer to Kislev and Hanukkah, I might put a menorah behind me just for fun. <laughs> Very cute. That might work. Um, you know, I guess in transitioning from your life, um, you know, from the walls of the Smedish of Ner Yisrael through your years in Wall Street, any wisdom or teaching from Chazal that you can think help and putting together an investment strategy. So I think you and I talked about this. And I'm going to tell a slightly different story than I did before, because it was really, really, to me, it was really funny. I didn't remember it when I told you. But um, when I got hired at Smith Barney and then became Solomon Smith Barney, eventually became Citigroup. Um, and when I got hired, the guy who hired me was a guy named D. Larry Smith. Um, Larry Smith was married to a Jewish woman, could not understand that I'd never had a cheeseburger in my life and, you know, asked me, can't I have a cheeseburger and then ask for forgiveness later? Um, now with the impossible burger, we can kind of play around with that. But, um, but, but the notion of, um, you know, being, know, knowing I come from Nair Israel, or, or my resume said Nair Israel, you know, rabbinical college. Um, and he said, I just want you to know, when he gave me the offer, he said, I just want you to know that we're not here to sell absolute truth. We're here to sell stock. This isn't, you know, rabbinical school. And years later, I ran into him. He's no longer my boss. I ran into him once in San Francisco in an office. Uh, he was leaving. I was coming in to see a different client. And, and we said hi and everything. I said, you know, Larry, you're not going to remember this, you know, conversation. But it had a lot of impact on me. And, you know, here I am five, six years later. You were wrong. And he said, what do you mean? He said that we're not here to sell absolute truth. We're here to sell stock. And actually, absolute truth is what makes stocks go up. We, we always tell investors that the way to make money in markets is exploiting the gap between perception and reality. Reality always wins. You just have to figure out the timing for when that reality will come out. So people have great misperceptions about stocks and about investing in general. And it's usually because of our experiences, but there's no kind of real objectivity to it. There tend to be very great subjective views. For example, saying a stock is cheap or a stock is expensive is a subjective view. I can go back and test which valuation metrics have been the most predictive of stock price performance, not is it cheap or expensive. So I have to be able to park that partiality or that bias that is inherent. And again, when your name is to bias, it's kind of a verb. Um, so you gotta be able to remove that and, and kind of look at data and be very, very non-emotional about it. Um, that's what we create, I mentioned in those videos, our panic euphoria model, which is our primary sentiment metric. It measures not how, how I feel, not how you feel, but how actually investors position themselves. And then we can back test and say, what are the probabilities of, of making money look like versus kind of a random outcome? So I'm not a quantitative analyst, but I understand the value of that kind of mathematical study. Um, so, you know, if we think about what's so core is MS, right, is truth. And trying to find that is, is, pretty, is pretty important in life, not just in, you know, sitting through a black Gemara and, you know, Stewie's on. I was just on with your brother earlier and doing a Vodazara and, you know, trying to figure out what the absolute truth on what is a Vodazara, how are you, Bitula Vodazara, things like that. But, okay, that's, that, that's a, a Torah truth, but there are life, life truths from that that we learn. And it, to me, it's, it's, I mean, I've had a lot of fun doing my job for the most part. There, there are certain days that I don't, but um, most of it's just a lot of fun because you're constantly trying to pit your work against really, really smart people all over Wall Street. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of mitzvahs and observance, any interesting <laughs> anecdotes from your global travels and interactions? So I'll, I'll say this. Most people are very respectful. There are a few that aren't. Um, and when you get to places like Asia, they have literally no idea what Kashrus is or Judaism is for that perspective. So there it's kind of funny. And what I would say is the, the you know, I get around it. It's, it's not easy. You, you have to 
be thoughtful and prepare things in advance. And if they're going to go to a Trafe restaurant, you got to call them up and find out what you can get at that restaurant so you don't look like a total weirdo. Um, and it, it, it's complicated but doable. You just have to be. You just have to prepare. So I would say one thing that I've, that I've always loved is is, is when you're traveling um, and you get to. And usually, if I'm in Europe or in Asia, I'm there for Shabbos, right? Because I have, I'll see, I'll, I'll go to eight countries in ten days. So for those of you who think travel is fun, it isn't. Um, but when you get to when you get to Shabbos and you're sitting in in Hong Kong or in Singapore, and you go into the Jewish center or the Chabad or whatever, and you you get to meet people, and it's just you reconnect. You you kind of feel you get. Ex- by the way, you get excited, believe it or not, when you get on an airplane to get a kosher meal. Okay. Most of us who've had experience with kosher meals on airplanes probably don't think it's the greatest thing on earth. Um, but when you're not eating, it's like, I don't care. This is a piece of chicken. It's rubber. I don't care. It's kosher. I can eat it. I'm excited. But when you're away for Shabbos and you reconnect with like your Yiddish guy in a certain respect, yes, you're putting on fill in the morning and talus and davening, but it's very different when you're with the community and you feel like your life is, re, you know, recharged in a certain respect because they're I define my life as sometimes you know divided being there's Tobias and there's Tuvia and they're they're you know they're they're different time slots for for both of those lives and it's weird in that respect for most people to hear that but that's how you have to actually operate. Um, I'll tell you my favorite one of my favorite stories okay and then and and that was sitting at a when I before I did the strategy work um, I spent 15 years covering industrial companies. And this was really interesting for me. A nice Jewish boy from Montreal went to Shiva his whole life. And all of a sudden you're going to farm country to look at farm equipment. You're going to uh, mining areas. Uh, I went to one crazy mining area off, off, literally off the coast of England where you went down an elevator two miles and went out three miles underwater to where they're doing underground mining. Talk about claustrophobia, but um, you're, you're seeing all this stuff that you've never seen before in your life, hanging out with, I mean, really interesting people, salt of the earth, but totally unconnected to anything you've ever experienced. So I'm out at a Caterpillar meeting at their proving ground in Peoria, Illinois, and they're showing us all their new equipment, all their new construction equipment, mining equipment. Um, it's pretty fascinating. You can get to drive some of those things, by the way, if you've ever really wanted road rage, a 60 ton, mining machine where you have to climb up um, like 12 feet to get into the cab to drive it. Um, it is like the most amazing experience around. But um, the we're in the proving ground they have the, and they break for lunch and they have all these fire pits going with steaks and burgers and hot dogs and, you know, and pork ribs and whatever going on. And they're very nice. The investor relations people got me a sandwich from like Delta Airlines, this kind of, you know, little teeny thing in a cellophane, you know, uh, bag that you rip open and you're thrilled that you have your three slices of bologna and you spread on the, the mustard and you're, you're like excited that you can eat something, right? And all of a sudden, Glenn Barton, who's the CEO of Caterpillar at the time, walks by and he says, looks at me and he goes, he goes Tobias, what are you eating? And I said, it's a little sandwich. He says, well, why don't you go get yourself some steak or some ribs or something like good? Like that looks kind of really crummy. I said, "Well, Glenn, I eat kosher, and you guys, are, you know, your, 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 your people were really nice and got me the sandwich." And he says, "Wait a minute, you eat kosher? You're Jewish?" Like, for I think most people here, Lefkovich sounds like a Jewish name, but if you're not in that world, Lefkovich sounds like a Ukrainian Slavic name. They they have really no connection to the way we would think about it. And he says, "You're Jewish," and he looks over at the other guy sitting next to me. We're on these picnic tables. And he says, "Chuck, move over." One of my competitors, a guy named Charles Harris or Chuck Harris, says, what? He says, I need to talk to Tobias about Judaism. And I go like, and he looks at me, he says, but Glenn, I'm Jewish too. He says, yeah, but you're not eating kosher. Move over. <laughs> and, and Chuck moves over a little insulted. And, um, and Glenn says, that. he says, that's amazing. He says, you know, I grew up in Peoria and I lived in a two-story home. We were upstairs and downstairs were the owners of the home. And it was Mr. Katz. And Mr. Katz was a pharmacist in Peoria and they were kosher. So I would like I, every Friday night, I'd come to their home and I'd make the turn on the lights and then come down later and turn the lights off. He, I was their Shabbos boy. And he knew the term and everything. It was just a really funny story. And he said to me, he says, like, I still remember the chicken soup. I still remember the cholent. I still remember the kogel. And I said, Glenn, in Sabbath, you want, you're welcome to come to my house and have that as well. 
he never took me up on the offer, but he was so excited about it. So that was probably one of my most positive experiences. Again, I've had some bad ones, but um, I, don't, I don't want to necessarily share those. Uh, um, well, I'm going to just show a, a very brief clip. I'm going to take all of us back. Some of us don't want to remember this, but in order to appreciate the question, we're going to go back to September of 08. Uh, Rabbi Pardo is going to show a clip here, just a, a minute or so of it, just to get into the moment. Apple's up more than 6% right now. Google about 3%, but Dell, Intel, Research Motion, and Microsoft are all to the upside. Look how strong. Did not disappoint. 400 points higher. Yes, indeed. The market's more higher. Last 30 minutes of trading as volatility once again rules the day. Most of the techs this morning, if not all of them, have just exploded to the. Down 1.7% here, a loss of 37 points or so. Apple shares are just getting hammered this morning. We're down by between 3 and 4.5% 4 .5 generally across these markets. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. We're red everywhere, essentially, down by 4 5%. We're down over 16%. Dow, at the same time, has fallen about 18%. The stock market is now down 21%. Because we're now down 43%. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Two year no yields went from 190 to 166 in the blink of an eye. And the NASDAQ, everything and more has been completely wiped out. It was the worst day on Wall Street since the crash of 1987. From the financial capital of the world, the opening bell is going to ring. In uh, five seconds, and to be honest with you, we wish it wouldn't. Traders here working the phone say a lot of their customers are freaked out, waiting to see how low the Dow will go. They're focused on the Dow, not so focused on OPEC. Yes, OPEC did cut production by one and a half million barrels per day. Really, you're seeing just broad-based declines across all of the major technology sectors. Apple's under pressure. Uh, Yahoo down eight and a half percent. Cisco six and a half percent. Research. So I know for many of us, that's a time period that we uh, certainly don't remember, and some of us are still climbing out. Um, but I want to, the reason I play that is because the next question is, Tuvia, you're in the middle of that. You're driving home from work. It's Erev Rosh Hashanah. You know you're heading into two days. What's in your mind? And, and what's in your mind over the two days of Rosh Hashanah? So I, I, I'm going to put it in, in context of um, I left early. It was because it was Erev Yontif. I knew I had to write something up for our investor base. Um, as I'm driving home, I'm talking to our traders, our, our salespeople, a bunch of clients, some of my, my colleagues in, in the strategy area, um, talking to people in Europe as well at that time. And um, it was a very challenging drive home in terms of trying to think of how to compartmentalize this and how to explain it. And I got home and I spent the next three hours on my laptop, you know, working like crazy, um, got my note of my thoughts and what we thought the next few days might bring as well, because I knew I was going to be out of pocket. And um, I got that information to my team and they took care of it, you know, thereafter, and literally it was 15 minutes before Shoshana, when I finally finished and got it done. And I jumped in the shower because I'm Short shot, I've got two days. Um, I think everybody in Chile was happy that I like, took a shower first. And, um, you know, and then you sat there saying, you know, going into um, davening and, and kind of thinking about my, my tealists were maybe a little bit different than many others um, in the sense that I was, yes, doing all the stuff that we normally do, but I was also sitting there saying, you know, Ravon Shalom, you know, please, no depression. We, we can't handle that. Americans are, for lack of a better term, we're just too soft. We don't know what hard times are. And in, in the sense that there are people who suffer terribly in this country, but I'm telling you, as a nation, we don't really know how bad things could be. And this market collapse, is it you know, something foreboding about the future? And that, that was going through my mind most of the, most of the davenings. Please, please, no depression. Okay. Now, so there is a question that uh, actually segues into the next uh, area that I wanted to focus on. There was a question, how has your father, a survivor, and his unique story influenced your life and success? 
So we actually have a clip that we're going to play of a trailer because your father's story was so compelling that they recently had a documentary put together that he, you know, was in. And maybe you could just give a little intro, then we'll answer that question after, you know, to okay. set up, uh, you know, this documentary that your father was featured in. And I might add, your father, your father, it would have been beautiful to have the two of you on at the same time, but he lives in Eretz Yisrael, and we would not want to do that to uh, someone in the middle. I don't of think it's a good idea. Look, he's nine. Can I know he's ninety-four years old? He might be up at four in the morning because older people do get up early in the morning. But he's actually a pretty good sleeper, thank God. Um, uh, with, with respect to, so my father, obviously, uh, no, I shouldn't say obviously. A lot of people don't know him. Um, survived the Holocaust. He, he was um, in many work camps, uh, for, in a weird way, fortunately, in slave labor camps as opposed to extermination camps. His family was unfortunately not so lucky as, as most of his family was, were, were murdered in Belzec um, very, very quickly after they were rounded up. Um, but he survived, came out of it, did some really fa you know, incredible stories of survival, um, uh, was was from from a little town near Krakow, but was in Krakow um, when the war started, and um, knew let's say the the Plasho, uh, work camp that a lot of people are familiar with from Schindler's List, um, and after the war did some really phenomenal things in terms of trying to hunt down Nazis and um, also try to save Jewish children who had been put into um, you know, non-Jewish families to try to to help them survive through and, and then after the war, try to reconnect them if there was any family or at the very least get them back to, to Yiddishkeit um, and to Jewish environments. Um, so in many respects, he's, he's a great hero. Um, and obviously has a lot of influence in my life in a variety of ways, not just being my father, but in terms of some of the stories that occurred and we can save those for after. Um, I would say that in general, somebody said, um, you know, hey, you know, how has he contributed to, to my success? I'm going I'm to say two things. One, people are successful in a variety of ways. Um, and the, how you determine success is, is yes, for some people, it can be financial for some people. It's how good a parent you were, um, how, how did you influence other people around you, what kind of goma chesa you are. So I, I, you know, and that's one of the things my father taught us a lot as children about being, being, and we can talk about some of his stories after the clip, if you like. But um, he, he's, uh, for a five foot two little guy, he's he's really a giant. Okay, so maybe we'll just show the clip and then we'll, we'll get your answer on how he has influenced your life. Oscar Schindler said we need your help because he knew that I was looking for Nazis. I was a witness of the most notorious murderers on earth that destroyed my whole life, eliminated my whole family. More than 150 members killed for nothing, totally erased. I was left the only one in the world to bring them to justice. The Nazis, which I was in their camps, Plaschow to Auschwitz, Mauthausen, a camp called Mel Ebensee. My life was hanging on a thread, working day and night to catch Nazis. And I could do those things. It's, it's unbelievable. That was my destiny. We have to do something for your people. So I, I guess in, in you know in a, a very powerful question. Um, first of all, if you could just fill in, you know, in terms of you know he mentions Schindler and helping and assisting Schindler in terms of hunting down Nazis. Maybe if you could just elaborate on that part of his life, and uh, and as we and then as to answer the question in terms of you know that that influence that he has had on your life. So let me let me put one context on this. Is I, I have been pushing my father for many years to write a book about his experience and saying that you know he, he lived 120, but he's not a young man, and that you know the survivors are are we're losing them year after year after year. 
and we won't have the eyewitnesses per se. So put your put it down and work. So after lots of pressure, he finally got a ghostwriter to help him do that. Um, and after a few revisions, that book finally came out called From uh, from you know uh, from, so from the ashes to to Lachaim. Um, and and you know to to have that positive attitude on life is pretty impressive for people who went through that. So. I would say that that was probably one that, that led to the movie J Roots, which has a relationship with the young Israel as well. Um, found out about the story, investigated it, um, and then decided to create this documentary. It was released uh, in, in late last year in a premiere in London. Uh, my my brother, my sister, um, and I, and my you know my my son joined me, um, and we were able to be there with my father for that premiere. We were gonna do that in the States as well, unfortunately, COVID hit. Um, and over Tisha above, I think a number of people were able to, to see it live streaming um, right now. I'm not sure if you can see, in fact, you can't. I do have a copy, but I can't legally let anybody see that copy. I don't own the rights to it. Um, with regards to his influence, so again, this kind of positive attitude towards life, in other words, you have to live life. You can't. You can't live in a world that's that's full of misery. Um, and to have that positive attitude is is something that makes us all, you know, able to overcome whatever hurdles we face. Number two, I would say, um, I mentioned before, being gomel chesed. So let me let me give you an example. So my my father, at one point, um, became kind of a helper for one of the commandants in the camp, and he he weird story where he like he was called forward and he like gave a fake salute clicked his wooden boot and shoes together and basically said you know whatever in, in, in my father speaks kind of about nine languages and um he spoke german to me he, he raised his rank let's say it was a major he called him general um and he said you know herr Wilberstumfuhr, or whatever it was you know um you know, I could I could shine your boots till till you know that you'll see the you know, the sun shining off or the moon shining off something like that. And he the guy laughed a little bit at this little you know at that point teenager Jew you know emaciated saying this and he said you know what tells the adjutant next to him have him come and shine my boots. And so every day he would go up this hill to where the commandant's house was and go and shine his boots. And then they said. Also, you know, it feed the, the the rabbits. So he had a little like collection of animals and he would go in there and he said, he, my father will say he fed the first rabbit himself. So he took potatoes or carrots, whatever it was there and he was able to eat something which he wasn't getting obviously um, enough of in terms of what they were feeding their prisoners. Um, so what he would do is he would smuggle food back with him to share with his um, barracks mates. And you know the other his, the other Jews who were you know in, in the, were being tormented by the Nazis, and and he would do this every every day basically um, at the risk of his own life, but was kind of helping others. So it was you know something he taught his his children that that you have that achrayus, you have that responsibility. Um, and again, for us, we're not risking our lives necessarily to do that. So um, pretty kind of powerful. Um, Mention Oscar Schindler. So um, he knew because he was from Krakow, everybody knew who Oscar Schindler was and what he was doing to help Jews. And um, at one point, my father was beaten by Amon Geth, the commandant for those who saw the, the movie, the crazy guy shooting people from the balcony. Um, and he was beaten almost to the, you know, to the, to death. And he, was, he doesn't remember this, he, he was unconscious. Um, and apparently the capo said, Schindler pulled, uh, not Schindler, uh, Geth pulled out his gun to shoot him, lying there, and, and the capo said, don't worry, he's dead anyway, don't waste the bullet. And then he was staying in the hospital, and he came to a couple of weeks later, and, and he was told the story by the capo when he showed up, you know, out of the whatever hospital they had, he came back to the barracks, the capo said, oh, you're still alive, wow, you know, and he explained, and he told them what happened. Um, and Amangeth was definitely a target for my father to go after the war and, and you know, to, to bring justice, not revenge, justice. Revenge for him was more about raising a family that kept Torah mitzvahs. That was much more important to him. That, to, to him, that's the ultimate revenge on Hitler, is you tried to wipe us out, we're not wiped out, 
were here and my parent, my father lived in South America after the war, met my mother there, um, Allah Shalom. And she, she got out well before the war, thankfully. Um, and um, the, my brother and my sister were both born in Bogota, Colombia. And when my brother got to five or six years old, they said, like, there's no Jewish schools here. And this was a very important commitment to, to him in terms of, again, raising a family to our mitzvahs and uh, had to, decided to leave. Um, and they came to America, but that America was Canada. And I still, I remember during when we were sitting Shiva for my mother, my father was telling the story to somebody. And I asked my father, when you did that pilot trip to New York, because that was the first place he thought of, he was in the diamond business, it made sense. And um, he looked around and said, this is too busy, crazy for my mother. She's used to a more, you know, relaxed lifestyle in South America. Um, and so he said, you should go check out Montreal. And he went to Montreal and he was very impressed with the community and with the, uh, it's not too far from New York if you have to go in for business. And I asked my father after, and he said, we're going to Montreal. I said, when did you do, like, when did you make this visit? Like, what, what, what date? And he said, like, May, June. I said, yeah, I don't think you would have made the same decision in December. Mm. They were coming from a very tropical place to go to what was probably a very fierce first winter. Um, and for my mother, she left her entire family in South America. So I, I, I said this when I was sitting in Shiva for I'll say again, it was like lech lecha me'artzacha for her. She, she gave up everything um, for kids to have Jewish educations. Right, right. And uh, so I would just say, obviously, it's such a compelling story in terms of the life that he, that he lived. And uh, as you had mentioned, what, <laughs> and still no, and lives, lives, and still lives. Um, and we didn't even get to talking about him finding, you know, maybe another time in terms of finding the uh, the Jewish children who were hidden. Um, I was just wondering, you know, in what way do you see, um, let's say, either your role or the role in general of people who, um, you know, interacting with individuals who are the best and brightest in today's investment world and the Jewish philanthropic and educational, you know, how, do, how, how, how should they see their role in, in doing good in this world? Look, I, I think there, again, there are different ways of, of doing it. I, I can only impact what I can impact. I, I deal with a lot of um, these really incredible, powerfully wealthy hedge fund managers who are incredibly philanthropic. Um, I think Wall Street gets a really bum rap a lot of the time. Um, it's, it's every industry has their bad, their bad apples. Um, and the amount of generosity and, and, and spirit of that uh, is, is remarkable amongst these people. I, I, I have rarely asked anybody, I did once, um, and this was during, um, uh, what was it called? I forget the operation now, um, something edge when, 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 when the Israeli troops were going into- Active edge. Sorry? Protective edge. Protective edge. So when, when the troops are going in, my nephew, Noam, went in as, as, a, as a soldier into, he made Aliyah, uh, was, was a chayal, and he went into, uh, into Gaza in some of the really horrible battles. And, um, you know, and I got an email saying, we don't have the right kind of protective vests. So I sent that an email they, they needed for their Italian, these protective vests, these early armies protect them with certain things, but they're older vintage, they're lighter, better vests they could buy, but the army doesn't provide it. It's the only time I've ever asked people on Wall Street to, to for some money for this purpose. Um, I sent an email to about 25 people, mostly not from, and um, I raised in 15 minutes the money to um, not outfit his battalion, but five battalions. So, and, and that was just the one time, but I also know so many of these guys who set up educational uh, funds, um, you know, scholarships everywhere. It's, it's really remarkable. I don't think people really appreciate how some of these people have, have given like crazy. Um, and, and they do it nationally as well as internationally, but I mean, they do it for the nation as well as for the Jewish people. Um, so I'll give you one example because of public information. David Rubenstein, who runs uh, Carlisle, um, gave $100 million to the Smithsonian Institute. 
and redid, he put up all the money to rebuild after the, the uh, Washington Monument was cracked. He put up all the money to fix the Washington Monument so that it's there for, the, for Americans. So it's, it's not just what they do for the Jewish community. They do a lot for the general community and they get trashed regularly in the media. And it, it's really upsetting to me. Um, I, I think the only thing we can do is, is really make Kiddush Hashem. Like, don't be the Phil Hashem. When I see the scandals that encompass members of the, the Jewish community, I, I will tell you that I'm personally disgusted. There, there are about 25, 30 people that I'm regularly in contact with, a little chabura of guys on Wall Street. Um, we all know who the bad guys are. And when we find out that they get ca caught, it's like, well, big surprise. Um, it, it isn't a surprise. We're very aware of it. Um, so it's sad that it occurs, but that's the only thing you can do is just make sure that you're not the one. And the problem is when those scandals occur, you're the rabbi, not I don't know, smicha, but I'm saying you're the rabbi for your colleague. How could that happen? How could you do that? And you get to some interesting theological discussion. There's one portfolio manager. Whenever we have a meeting, we set it up for two hours because he's a devout Christian. And the first hour is just discussing theology. He said, I was reading Genesis last week, and you know, I was I, I, like, where I was reading the Exodus, like, how could the Jewish people, the children of Israel, have the golden calf? Like, he doesn't get it. <laughs> like, after all the miracles, and we obviously have the same. And I have to explain to him the some of the, you know, some of the fortune talking about it as an intermediary. It wasn't really, they believe this calf was what saved them. Um, but they still need that connection between themselves and God, not the intermediary. But it's a, it's a weird kind of conversation. To have, especially when you're dealing with somebody who isn't Jewish and doesn't have the same background. But it, but it was, kind of, but it's fun. I actually enjoy this. We're really good friends, um, you know, and and we're, you know, we have a great relationship. And you get to talk about things that are not typical with some people. Most of it, most of it's very businesslike. And once in a while, it gets a little fun. And and uh, particularly if you're out at a bar with them having a few drinks, then it really gets interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you have, uh, as, we, as we wind down, do you have a final message uh, for everyone listening? So somebody asked me and Shul this question last night after Shai's um, sheer, um, you know, what do I think about the markets where it's going to, I said, look, I'm not going to answer that question on Shabbos to begin with. Um, but it, it's more around what's your risk tolerance we actually put out something over the weekend talking about our outlook for 2021. We do think the market can go higher, not dramatically, but can. Um, the, the thing that, that, um, that I would say is you have to figure out your own risk tolerance when it comes to investing. What allows you to sleep at night and what doesn't? Um, and some people are more risk averse and some people are more risk tolerant. And that's a very personal issue. That's not something I can advise anybody to do. Um, I would say that you probably should have some of your portfolio in stocks because over time that's rewarded investors. Um, I think people tend to be so concerned about ever losing money that they hurt themselves. They're, they're too risk averse. Now, again, this is a very personal thing. So I'm not encouraging anybody to do something that doesn't let them sleep at night. Um, but I think some people are so concerned and they really hurt their long-term um, you know, goals by doing so but it's very personal. The other thing I would say is be really careful when people tell you about, you know, here's a great investment, you're gonna double your money, you're gonna triple your money. This is great, like, you know, um, I, I, I've i heard those pitches. I, I'm, I leave them on the sidelines. Do I do stupid investments? Yeah, I do. But I also know how much I can risk on those investments before I make them. And, you know, a few of them work out and some of them really don't work out. And it's only told me a long time ago, that there, there are certain investments you make kiddush over and there are certain investments you make kaddish over. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you have to actually have that mindset of it's not always going to work out because and, and realize you only risk what you can afford to really risk. You don't risk things that you can't afford to risk. And again, people get trapped in the idea of I'm going to make so much money, I'm going to make so much money. And, and that's unfortunately how they get suckered in to less than scrupulous investments or investors who are putting out the money I invested in something that literally went to zero because of COVID. Um, something happened, the markets blew up and this had to do with trading carbon credits in California. And it literally went to nothing in three days. Now I knew that there was always that risk. So I'm not really angry at the person who presented the idea to me. It was something I was putting in my portfolio as a diversification 
idea. It wasn't a ton of money. Um, I still don't like losing money. I don't think anybody does. Um, but it's I'm not going to lose sleep and I'm not going to lose my my you know my health over that because I, I was aware there was risk. Um, and I think that's the best advice I can give anybody. Uh, for young people who want to go into finance, it is not as much fun as it used to be. Um, it's a much more challenging industry than it was 30 years ago when I went into it. Um, it doesn't mean that people can't do well. Uh, but recognize when you hear about these, this guy who made $100 million or a billion dollars as a hedge fund, there are probably 30,000, 40,000 other people who failed. So there's, you know, this, you get to see that winning, it's, you know, think about how many pitchers make it to the major leagues and don't even succeed there. And think about how many people don't. There was a great commercial um, for autism. Um, a number, you know, for not for it, but for raising money to fight autism, and it taught and it showed on it you know, what the probabilities were to be a, a baseball player, a ballerina, you know, one out of ten thousand, one out of fifteen, all these kind of things. And then it talked about what what's the number to, to for autism was like one out of forty. So, people have a higher probability of of getting, unfortunately, that kind of outcome than being that really successful hedge fund manager. So, I think people have to set their sights appropriately and not just, you know, jump too far. And, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't follow your passions. And I, that, that's probably the most important thing I would tell you, follow the things you really love. I saw one of the questions, how did I get into investments? Pure luck. Um, and the, there's another lovely story I like telling you. I, I worked for a guy, um, Leonard Wilson, who I have a lot of Akar Satov to. He's now in his, his 80s. Um, just a really phenomenal teacher, mentor. And Len, Len was a conservative Jew. Um, and trust me, if you ever met Len, he had a really Jewish nose. Um, I don't think he's on, so I'm not going to get in trouble for saying that. But um, And the first business trip I ever took was to Des Moines, Iowa. Okay, and I went to, no, sorry, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, even worse than Des Moines. And I'm walking to the Cedar Rapids Country Club with the chief executive officer of the company, my boss, Len, is walking with the chief financial officer about 30, 40 feet ahead of us. And he said, how long have you worked for Len? And I said, six months. And he said, how are you finding it? And I said, I, I'm loving it. And he goes, what do you mean? I, said, I can't believe they pay me to do this. This is so much fun. And, and I said, but I don't want to say that too loud because I really do want a bonus and I don't want Len to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, again, I've been fortunate. I found something I got really passionate about, but I kind of lucked into it. It wasn't the original plan, if you want to think about that. Um, I was I was thinking um, lawyer initially, but then I realized law school was three years, business school was two years, and I really don't want to spend an extra year in school. I wasn't one of those most studious types. Let's put it that way. I, I think a lot of people in Nary Stroll will probably back me up on that. <laughs> um, there was one other question I saw popped up, which I'm going to answer. Um, Brian, the Canadians will win the Stanley Cup. Um, they're, they're a much better team after the off-season trades. So um, we're, we're, we're very encouraged. Uh, but we, we can talk offline on that. And that's another passion I got growing up in Canada was hockey. I really don't get baseball. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, game of strategy, but yeah, whatever. Uh, message time, we could do a lot better with uh, our understanding and appreciation of hockey and uh and uh, international relations, God willing, uh, this time of year. In the meantime, though, I wanted to thank you, Tuvia, uh, Tobias, to the rest of the world, but Tuvia to us. Um, uh, taught a lot, taught us a lot about risk, but and uh, risk assessment, but also about uh, Kiddush Hashem, being in Kiddush Hashem and living a life that we can all hope to emulate. That uh, I'm, I'm sure is uh, an incredible That's right. credit. That's right. You want to emulate? Not probably me. I didn't tell you any of the bad stories. Uh, the, the, the bad stories. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll focus on the good ones. Aspire to those. Um, and uh, I also want to thank Rabbi Axelrod, who uh, really led us uh, through this journey. This really was a a conversation in the fullest sense, um, all over the place. A lot to unpack. But as a Hashem, want to thank uh, Rav Shai Shachter and Rabbi Ari Zatz for organizing Mr. Henry Orlinsky uh, as the uh, chair of Torah Initiatives for uh, spearheading the concept in the first place. Please join us uh, next Mose Shabbos. We're going to be with Rabbi Hain and Ben Brofman. Uh, the, this recording is going to be up on OU Torah. 
and you'll be able to find the archived version here. And anyone who wants to sign on next week, the exact same time, uh, if you found the Zoom link a little uh, difficult, uh, it's we've made it ou.org slash conversations uh, is the easiest way to pop into this. So uh, tell your friends, tell your frenemies, and Matt Hashem, have, a, have an incredible week full of opportunities for Kiddush Hashem. And we'll see you here next week. All right. Good night, everybody. Good fach. Thank you again, Tovia. Good fach. Good fach.